Hey folks, welcome back to History and Politics Chat on June 16th. I think it is June 16th, 2020. My name is Heather Cox Richardson and I'm a professor of history. When I do these, I do not speak for my employer. So let's get down to it. You guys had a lot of really interesting questions this week because usually in my experience, your questions are really closely tied to modern day stuff. You know, what's an executive order? Um, what's history of the post office? Things that are very much in the news. And I suppose everything from this week was in the news too, but I really think of it as historical because it's all in my wheelhouse. So uh, let's get into that material. And I got to tell you, this is I'm going to talk today about Confederate statues, about um, taxes, and about um, voter suppression. And um, they're, they're maybe on the surface, they sound a little dry. If you're thinking, you know, you might have to, you know, I don't know what, go hang your laundry if you have to hear about the history of taxation. But I actually promise you it's really interesting stuff. The actual history of, of figuring out the history of taxation, that's maybe not something you want to spend your lives doing. Let me tell you, I actually read the entire Civil War tax debates, including on whether or not they should tax a barrel of sugar at like 0.5 cents or 0.7 cents. I mean, it was really grim. And I'm making up those numbers, by the way, but it went on for much longer than anybody should have had to read. Uh, I won't give you that stuff. I'll give you why it all matters. And so hang in there, even if you think maybe you don't want to hear about the history of taxation, I think maybe in the end you will find it as interesting as I do. So let's start here um, with uh, a question. I've actually, again, I've grouped your questions again. So, um, so I'm going to start here, though, with a question from Pauline Francis. And she says, what has been the ebb and flow of federal income tax cuts as a political tool? Who's done the most cutting and increasing of tax rates for individuals? I assume there's a correlation between times of good economic opportunity and bad. Have corporations always been considered persons under the tax code and subject to income taxes? Well, just for the record, there's like four questions tied up in that, and I hope to be able to get to all of them. Uh, the history of taxation is actually way simpler than anybody gives it credit for because it sounds hard and it's really not hard at all. So, um, so let's start here with the history of American taxation and the recognition that the, the Constitution gives Congress the power to apportion direct taxes on the states. That is, the Congress can go ahead and raise money by going to states and asking them to, to pony up cash, which the Congress did not have uh, a lot of power to do under the Articles of Confederation, and now it can do that. So theoretically, it's going to have a lot more power, but that's not really how it's going to play out. So what happens is during the War of 1812, when the U.S. government really needs to raise money for the first time in a meaningful fashion, it goes to the system of asking states to kick in money. And they do do it, but they do it in, in um, really piecemeal fashion. So they all do it in different ways. Some people have the cash, some people don't. System doesn't work terribly well. So uh, then after the war, those taxes are, again, it's the states that are responsible for those. So after the War of 1812, the US government doesn't really need a lot of taxation money because it raises most of its money through tariffs, which are, again, an economist would say this is not what they are, but that's not what we're doing here. They're essentially taxes on goods imported into the country. And those uh, it, tariffs are arranged in such a way that they can raise the little bit of money that the US government needs to function. And that's the way the government is going to proceed until 1861. And in 1861, as I talked about last week on the history uh, uh, Facebook thing I do, um, in 1861, when Abraham Lincoln takes office, he's in a really bad place because financially, because not he personally, the US government is, because the, the tariffs that had made up the bulk of the money coming into the treasury came through Southern ports because it was really the South that had the really big money in the 1850s, especially after there was a major panic in 1857, which kind of wiped out a lot of the industries in the North. It's the South that's cotton, that's got the cash coming in. And when the southern states secede, even before Lincoln takes office, they're like, you know, we're not handing over this money. It's now ours. So when Lincoln takes office, he turns to his secretary of the treasury, Salmon P. Chase, a guy from Ohio, and he says, you know, what, what do we got going on here for money? And Chase gives him a report on the finances of the United States, and they're really grim. They have, they're literally like 
like three pages long and handwritten and they say we owe a lot of money and there's nothing coming in so from the beginning the US government has to scramble to find money and what it does in 1861 is it puts together a new new system of American taxation and in that system of American taxation and that 61 law people don't tend to pay a lot of attention to it simply because it's cobbled together it's got a little bit from the war of 1812 system it's got um, you know, a little bit of this, it's got a little bit of that. But one of the major things that it does innovate in is that it has an income tax. For the first time in American history, the federal government puts a tax on American incomes. And, um, and that really carries over into 1862 when, um, when they rewrite the tax bill and this major, major tax bill. So if you look up the history of Civil War taxes, people tend to, to look at the 62 law. Um, it it's, uh, was H.R. 312. Um, under that law, uh, the, the Congress does something huge. And what it does, first of all, is first of all, it taxes just about everything. But it puts taxes on manufactured products, uh, on all of them, anything it can think of. And those are called manufacturing taxes at the time. Uh, but what they do is they get handed on to the consumers. And what this does is it ties everybody into a system of taxation. So for the first time, everybody is paying taxes to the federal government. Even if it's only a few pennies on something, on a paintbrush you're buying or on quail eggs, which are taxed, um, you're paying these manufacturing taxes. So uh, there's other taxes that go in place as well, but this is the first national system. And then in addition to that, they create the income tax and they graduate the income tax because they recognize that they cannot make the taxes high enough on the lowest incomes to be able to raise the kind of money they need to fight the Civil War. So they invent this graduated system of income taxes. Also, they have a big debate in Congress about how to do that. Like, how are you going to raise this money? Because nobody's got the apparatus to do it. And they fight about whether or not the apparatus to raise these taxes should be in the states or should be in the federal government. And what they conclude is that the federal government is going to be so much more efficient about collecting this, these taxes that what they really need to do is invent a new system of federal taxation and they create what is essentially the what is now the irs it's not called the internal revenue service at the time i think it's called um the bureau of internal revenue uh, off the top of my head i don't remember um but it's the exact same thing i mean when they change the name they simply change the name it's not infrequent for um for the names of congressional department i'm sorry of government departments to change over time and military departments for that matter as well they simply change the name reflecting um the the times and reflecting uh perhaps in terms of military which sections of the military are more important than others at certain times so they create in 62 this new system of taxation a national system of taxation and income taxes and uh and they put those in place under a federal under a federal uh, system of tax collection. And this is actually enormously popular. This is enormously popular at the time. So um, the, the other thing about the income taxes that they put in place in, um, uh, in 62 is that they were designed to expire. They were designed to, um, to be wartime taxes and not to continue after the war because they didn't really understand at the time what the post-war years would look like. And there's a lot of measures they take during the war that they think are only wartime measures. The greenbacks that I talked about last week were, were also supposed to be a wartime measure, and they too uh, end up becoming part of late 19th century politics. But anyway, so they write this, this tax bill in such a way that it's supposed to expire in 1872. All right, so hang on to that thought. So um, they have these taxes, they're supposed to expire, the war ends, things are really expensive because that war was, it would cost almost, uh, uh, it cost several billions of dollars, which people couldn't even get their heads around at the time. And when it comes time for the income tax to expire, um, the uh, Congress, uh, there's, there's actually um, real anger at the time because of the idea that people with a lot of money are making out like bandits in the 1870s and not paying very much in in uh, toward the government. So they actually extend the income tax for a little bit. But the income tax expires by statute in the 1870s. All right, so, but that wasn't really actually um, the question. The question was the ebb and flow of tax cuts. So this first tax actually expires in the 70s, and that's the income tax. Um, and increasingly, again, the income from the federal government comes to rely on tariffs. And those tariffs become such an important part of the American financial system that um, 
the way they work is that they actually create a wall around America so that uh, the, the companies inside America don't have to compete with foreign companies who can make things more cheaply. And the idea behind that is to nurture American industries. But by the 1880s, what it means is that American industries, the people who run them, are colluding to raise prices. And people get angrier and angrier about tariffs. And tariffs come to symbolize the power of big business because they're putting pressure on Congress to keep these tariffs in place. And workers and people who are not making money from the, the industries look at this and say, this is insane. We're protecting the steel industry so that, you know, uh, the, the Andrew Carnegie can, can gobble up all the little producers and raise his prices. And so they're using the big businesses using tariffs to collude to raise prices. But they don't want those tariffs to come down because they don't want, obviously, they want their high prices, but they also don't want foreign competition. So by the late 1880s, the U.S. government is bringing in so much money money from tariffs that it's actually running a surplus. So by 1889, as these surpluses are there and the Republicans keep saying, we have to keep these tariffs because otherwise the economy is going to go and, you know, going to crash. People are looking at these tariffs and they're saying, you have those tariffs so high, you're actually socking money away in the treasury and we can't use it to, as a circulating medium. You have got to lower the tariffs. And one of the things that the Republicans do to stop uh, the, these accusations that they need to lower the tariffs is they start to put up public statues. You're going to hear about those again, which is why, for example, if you think about Boston Common, for example, or New York, there will be so many statues from the Revolutionary War period made in the 1890 to 1920 period. It's because the real money to make these came in from the federal government in about 1889 because they're trying to pay down that surplus. They also start to provide pensions to Civil War veterans and also to veterans of some other wars as well. But this is when we get the first major Civil War Pension Act. And I just have to put in here, I don't know if anybody saw it, but about two weeks ago, I think it was, America paid out its last pension to a Civil War survivor. The woman was the child of a Civil War veteran, and um, and I think she made like 73 bucks a month uh, at the end of her life. But until the last month of time, we continued to pay pension, Civil War pensions, which just highlights how really short American history has been and how many of these themes uh, are really visceral, alive themes for people uh, because they didn't happen that long ago, if you think about it. Anyway, so they're trying to pay down the surplus. And the people who feel like the big business guys are taking all the money want to get rid of the tariffs. They're like, you know, like stop trying to pay out but pay out the the excess by giving away pensions and by building statues for God's sake. Just lower the tariffs so we don't have to pay out so much money when we buy our dinner pails and when we buy our um uh, you know, our clothing or whatever the things are that have been protected by, or sugar is a big one, we buy our sugar, for example. And the Republicans don't want to do that. They don't want to lower the tariff. But this fight between big business and the little guy all begins to focus on the tariff by the 1880s. It's like, that's what they're fighting about. If you want to say that you're on the side of the people, you're fighting about the tariff. The same way in the 1980s that I'll tell you a little bit about, if you want to say you're on the little guy, you talk about tax cuts. That comes to symbolize way more than just a financial transaction. It comes to symbolize the fight of the little guy against the takeover of government by these industrialists who are, you know, totally making bank by the 1880s, 1890s. They're building their, you know, cottages in Newport that have, you know, the children's uh, dollhouses have, you know, um, porcelain that's made in Europe and, you know, people have, you know, well, you know, like the breakers, all those things, those are from this era. And, you know, if you're working, you know, your hours on the steel, steel room floor, the steel, uh, the steel factory floor, you look at that and you're like, this is just not right. This is not the way things should be. All right. So what happens is this, um, as people begin to argue that this is not the way things should be, that the rich shouldn't have everything, a lot of people at the bottom start to say, you know, they're not paying their fair share. And we're the ones carrying the government and carrying them because of these tariffs. We want to lower the tariffs. Um, and yet we asked about taxes. So let me go back to that. So as this is going on, this is when we get the idea that corporations are people. And the way that that happens is um, in a really kind of weird backhanded way. So what happens is that in 1881, 
James Garfield is um, is assassinated. And um, he had been in a huge fight for control of the Republican Party with a man from New York named Roscoe Conkling. And it might be worth actually taking a, taking a look and looking up who Roscoe Conkling is as I'm talking about him, because I've got great stories about Roscoe Conkling, let me tell you. But one of the ones that always floors me is that he was known in his era as one of the handsomest men in America. And I think if you call up a picture of him, you will probably think that opinions have changed since the 1880s. Um, anyway, Roscoe Conkling had been locked in this fight with, um, with Garfield when Garfield was assassinated. And Garfield had actually just won in that fight to some degree. But in order to put pressure on Garfield and make him do what he, want, he Conkling, wanted Garfield to do, uh, Conkling had resigned from the Senate with the idea that he was going to be his, he was going to go home to New York and they were going to hit the state legislature, which at the time is what put uh, senators in, in office was going to triumphantly put him back there and he was going to, you know, metaphorically bury Garfield. So he resigns and he walks away along with his junior colleague, a guy named Thomas Platt, who became known for eternity after that as Me Too Platt. Anyway, they go back to New York and they say, we resigned from the Senate and now you're going to send us back there and we're going to show Garfield that that we, us here in New York, those of us who are uh, allied with Wall Street, we're the ones who really control the country and control politics. And the state legislature looks at Conkling and Platt and they're like, we are so sick of your crap. And, and that's not really what they say. A lot of people think he should go back, but a lot of people think Conkling sucks. So they don't send him back. And Conkling is known as the turkey cock, and he is his very expensive tastes. Uh, he likes velvet suits, like the one he's probably wearing in the picture if anybody's looking. And he likes fast women, and he likes very nice uh, food and wine. And uh, curiously enough, he doesn't like to be touched, which is a hard thing to imagine in this era of sort of rough and tumble physical po uh, physical politics. But he um, he doesn't uh, he doesn't actually like to touch people's hands, which is I think a really interesting tidbit about a 19th century politician. But so he's in trouble because he's been making all his money as a politician because he was the politician who ran New York. And as such, as, as goods came in on the, and the, the, the tariffs had to be paid, the people who collected those tariffs paid off the politicians. And he and his cronies were some of the people who were paid off in that situation. And by the way, his right-hand man was Chester Arthur, who is going to replace James Garfield when James Car Garfield is assassinated. Um, uh, Chester Arthur had never in his life held an elected office. He was put in that position to shut up Conkling, essentially. And to his credit, Chester Arthur, once he became vice president, cleaned up his act. He said, no, I'm not going to keep being corrupt. I'm not going to keep um, serving Conkling. And, um, and as a result, he pissed off both the Republicans and the Democrats, And um, because who didn't like him because he was a Republican. And so we never heard again from Chester Arthur. But if you've ever wondered the history of Chester Arthur, that's the history of Chester Arthur. Meanwhile, Conkling's in real trouble because he doesn't have an income anymore. And, uh, and he goes to, to Chester Arthur and he's like, well, this is great, let's run America. And Chester Arthur is like, sorry, dude, I'm vice president now. This means something, I'm not gonna work with you. And so he's in real trouble. So what does he do? He goes back to becoming a lawyer. And the first people through his door are the railroads because he's an extremely well-connected former senator. So he starts to represent railroads. And what he does in 1882, the whole story I just told you was 81 in 1882, he argues that uh, the 14th Amendment was designed to protect corporations. And he has the clout to say this because the 14th Amendment, which calls for due process um, uh, and calls for, for the, um, the establishment of African-American citizen, male citizenship, um, he, uh, he has the clout to do that because he was on the committee in Congress that wrote the 14th Amendment. Now, he's full of it. This is not what was, what was we now have the journals from the, the 14th Amendment Committee, and no, they were not talking about corporations at the time at all. In fact, in, when they were writing the 14th Amendment in, uh, in 67, people really weren't thinking about corporations at all because corporations really didn't take on a modern meaning until after the civil war the first really modern corporation starts after the civil war before the war corporations were a kind of a funny hybrid of public service and um and a, and a business charter and if anybody's interested someday i can tell you the history of corporations so he kind of makes this up for the benefit of his uh, of his client and no one pays a great deal of attention to it but crucially 
1886, the Supreme Court, in, 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 a, in another decision, looks back at what Conkling said in 82, 1882, and says, this doctrine that the 14th Amendment was intended to protect corporations is now accepted doctrine. So it becomes part of the American lexicon really without there being a congressional debate over it or any kind of um, really concerted decision, but it was a, it was a number, uh, it, it was Roscoe Conkling sort of saying, hey, I was at the 14th Amendment, this is what we meant, which is not at all the case. And the Supreme Court, which by 1886 is very interested in protecting big business saying, oh yes, now this is accepted doctrine. So that's where we get the idea that corporations or people is from Roscoe Conkling and his money problems, if you will. Now, of course, there is a larger body of legal history behind that. But in terms of the, the ebbs and flows of tax policy, that move on the part of Roscoe Conkling is enormously important. Okay, so there we are in the 1880s, and I've just told you we don't have an income tax, and we're getting all of our money from uh, from tariffs, and the the people are really furious about this because they're getting um, their their everything that they're buying is wicked expensive because of these tariffs, but there's nothing they can do about it because the Republican Party from 1860 when Abraham Lincoln is elected until 1880, no, 1890, 1892, sorry, I did it in my head. Um, until 1892, the Republican Party is always in control of at least one House of Congress um, and or the White House. So um, not it, it, it doesn't always have all of them, but it's always got one of them, which means that it can always stop tariff reform. So there have been moves on the part of the Democrats, uh, especially in the 1870s, to, um, to dial back the tariff, but they can't get anywhere because the Republicans have control of at least one House or the White House, so they're not able to do anything. And then something dramatic happens, and that's the election of 1892. And with the election of 1892, the Democrats take control of the White House and Congress for the first time since the Civil War. And this is huge uh, that this happens. And this is under Grover Cleveland. So, um, so the election of Cleveland with this Democratic House and Senate is a really big deal because what it does is it puts back on the table the idea of tariff reform. And with that idea of tariff reform, with the idea that those tariffs are going to come down, um, the Republicans go crazy. And instantly, as soon as Cleveland is elected, they say, that's it. The economy is going to crash. The Democrats don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to handle um, finances. Take your money out of business, put it under the mattress. If you have foreign investments in this country, take them home because this is all, you know, the, the Treasury is going to be destroyed by the Democrats. And by the way, the Treasury was kind of in trouble at that point because of the new Civil War pensions and because of all the public works statues, for example, that the Republicans had put in place to spend down the tariff. And so in fact, the Treasury was starting to hurt, but when the Republicans start to say, everything's going to crash, you, know, you need to take your money out, that's exactly what starts to happen. And so uh, the, the Secretary of the Treasury under the uh, Republicans, the, um, the, uh, the, the money men in the country go to Washington and they say to President Harrison, as the president at the time, do something. You know, the economy is slowing down, you know, the, the things look terrible. And he's like, no, I'm pretty good. And the... Um, the Treasury Secretary actually says to somebody, listen, all I got to do is I got to keep this country afloat until the Democrats come in, and then it's not my problem. And he almost does it, but not quite. The economy crashes in the Panic of 1893, 10 days before the Democrats take power. So everybody thinks that that, that, that crash is, is Grover Cleveland's fault. It is not. It happens quite deliberately under Republican President uh, Benjamin Harrison. So... Um, the economy has crashed. Cleveland, it's all in Cleveland's lap. And uh, you got Democrats in Congress. And the first thing that happens is Cleveland goes ahead and he tries to calm Wall Street. So he says, I'm not, I'm not going to mess with a lot of stuff. All the things I said I was going to do, I'm not going to do that. You guys need to calm down and bring your money back. And that splits the Democratic Party. So Cleveland is not going to be able to get much accomplished at all. But the Democratic Congress goes ahead and says, well, as long as we're in power, they lower the tariff, as they've been saying they're going to do forever, and they put in place an income tax again in 1894 to go ahead and to replace the income that's missing from the, the tariff that they've gotten rid of. 
When that happens, uh, a, a, a man challenges that, and the court case goes to the Supreme Court. And under Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust Company of 1895, the Supreme Court decides that the U.S. government is cannot put an income tax on the American people. That that is um, not a direct not a direct tax, which is what is authorized in the Constitution, and that a direct tax must be based on the census. So, for example, um, in and this is the complaint that the dissenters say about the case. Um, what that would mean is if you had if you divide the the needs of the government evenly in this period according to the census people in mississippi are going to be destroyed by the weight of the tax they have to bear while people in new york are not even going to notice it because of the varying values between these two places so after that happens um uh people look at the at this idea that you can't have a, an income tax uh and you can't equalize the pay between people having to um you know, between people in America. And the progressives look at this and they say, this is just ridiculous, come on. So in 1809, uh, they, for the first time, put in place a corporate excise tax on about one, per, I'm not about, on 1% of uh, a corporation's income over $5,000. And more importantly, in 1909, they propose an amendment to the Constitution saying that we can, in fact, have an income tax. It's proposed in 1909. It becomes a law in 1913. And that is a 16th Amendment that says, quote, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. And it's actually William Howard Taft who signs that, um, who, who puts that into play because he says, this is just stupid. You know, the Republicans are the ones who invented this and the government must have the power to raise money in the 20th century. And so that's how we get the 1913 um, uh, uh, edition of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution. All right, so this is all, probably all way more than anybody wanted to know, but the reason that I went into it in this depth is to lay down the history of what really happened, because then things speed up a lot in the 20th century. In the 20th century, with this new law in place, as soon as Woodrow Wilson and the Congress is elected in uh, 1912, goes into this sit in 1913, they passed what's known as the Revenue Act of 1913. And that Revenue Act of 1913 dramatically drops the tariff, first of all, which is why Republicans from the start hate Woodrow Wilson, among other reasons. Is other reasons too, um, but but that's when they really turn against him. Which he 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 takes a stand even before Congress Congress meets in um, in 1913. Um, but they also go ahead and they put an income tax in place, and that income tax to re, to replace the lost revenue. The income tax in the Revenue Act of 1913 is on one percent over three thousand dollars, and on incomes over five hundred thousand dollars, it's seven percent. So now we have in American fiscal policy an income tax, and it's going to be a huge football, because under uh, Woodrow Wilson during World War One, he imposes taxes on the American people, quite high taxes, in order to pay the expenses of World War One. And immediately after the war in 1920, when you get the landslide election putting Republican um, uh, Harding uh, back in, uh, Warren G. Harding back in office, the Secretary of the Treasury then, a man named Andrew Mellon, is horrified by these taxes and works very, very hard to slash the taxes again, believing that they're going to slow down growth. What he does by slashing those taxes and by actually offering sort of secret rebates to, to corporations and wealthy people um, in the 20s. What happens is that wealth dramatically moves upward in the 1920s. And again, we get the, um, the crash of 1929. And now, of course, I'm giving you a whirlwind tour. We get taxes again um, uh, under the Democrats in the 1930s, and especially wartime taxes during World War II, because there is this belief until, until the, the late 20th century that America absolutely must tax itself to pay for wars. After World War II, um, the, the Democratic presidents and then the Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, do not lower the taxes because they want to pay down the national debt. And, um, and Eisenhower is also determined to balance the, def the, the yearly budget, so he doesn't run yearly deficits. He is the last Republican to balance the budget, by the way. He is the last Republican not to run a deficit for the, for the yearly budget. Uh, Bill Clinton didn't as a Democrat, so he's much more recent, but 
but uh, uh, Eisenhower was the last Republican who didn't do so. And um, his, the, the, the top income tax bracket under Dwight Eisenhower was 91%. Um, every time somebody says to me, they want to go, you know, they're, I want to go back to the 1950s, not this socialism. I'm like, so do I. Upper tax bracket, 91%. And uh, uh, that's always kind of a surprise to the sort of people that make that comment. Anyway, so uh, so the first person actually to lower taxes after the war is uh, uh, JFK, John F. Kennedy, who lowers taxes in the 60s because he's worried that the upper level brackets are in fact slowing growth. But one of the problems that presidents face after um, after World War II and right up until really um, Nixon and maybe uh, Nixon really is they have lived through the depression and they are terrified, terrified, terrified of unemployment. So they don't like to, um, you know, they, they are desperate for the programs to keep people employed, but at the same time, they're not sure they like taxes. So what tends to happen is they seesaw back between cutting taxes and then raising taxes uh, from, from, um, from Nixon, um, Nixon and Carter. And then finally, we get into the idea of uh, cutting taxes under Ronald Reagan. And the real reason that Reagan has the leeway to do that is because in the 1970s, if those of you who remember, um, we had such inflation that lots of people kept making more and more and more money, which kicked them into higher tax brackets, even though that money no longer went as far as it did. And that was solely a reflection of the stagflation of the 1970s. But what that meant was it built up a momentum against taxes. People felt that they were paying higher and higher taxes, seeing less and less for it, at the same time that you had civil rights movements that were redistributing money to under served populations. And that created a perfect storm for Ronald Reagan to come in and talk about how paying taxes put money in the pockets of his welfare queen, for example. The person he, he talked about who um, he said had non-existent husbands and was collecting all sort of welfare money and who he implied was an African-American woman. And um, that idea of taxes now being a way to redistribute wealth, a form of socialism, uh, really uh, has been a driving force of American society since Reagan until we've gotten to the place we are now where there are still a number of people who insist that we are on the verge of socialism in America when in fact our taxes are at an all-time low and our social programs are virtually back to where we were in the 1920s, uh, a time when in fact uh, you couldn't begin to argue that we were in danger of socialism in America. So I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. This is probably more on taxes than a lot of people wanted to hear. But um, but it's so entwined in so much that we do, and you're going to hear more about that in just a second. All right. I love taxes. I mean, I love the history of taxes. So if anybody wants to know more about it at some point, let me know. Although you might all be asleep for all I know at this point. I actually can't see um, my comments because I'm reading. Uh, my, I've actually outlined these questions. All right. Anne Lebeck wants to know. At the end of the Civil War, why did the United States not completely suppress or dismantle all things Confederate? Secessionists and their leaders committed treason, yet the United States let them off fairly easily, which allowed these leaders to become heroes later on, complete with statues. Danny Smart, hi Danny, said, I know you've touched on this before, but can you provide some context historically for the Confederate symbols and statues in the South in light of the push to remove them? So many are saying that folks are trying to cleanse history. However, it seems there's some misunderstanding about exactly what history those statues and so on are commemorating and celebrating. These are t terrific questions both and obviously very much in the news. So let's start with what Anne wanted to know. Why didn't the U.S. completely suppress or dismantle all things Confederate? This is a terrific question, and I want to call to your attention the fact that there was an even bigger civil war going on during the same years as the American Civil War, and that, of course, was the Taiping Rebellion, some people call it, in China. And I have, I'm sorry if I offended anybody who does Chinese history. I am not a China expert. I only know what I read about it in the American context. All right, so what goes on with the Taiping is after the Taiping are um, suppressed by the imperial forces in China in, uh, in the same sort of around the same time as the US government, is all symbols of the rebellion, is, is my understanding, are removed and many, many, many of the people involved in the Taiping are, uh, are executed, are, you know, just their mass executions. And 
That's a really interesting counterpoint to what happened in America. Why didn't Americans do that? Because I, I want to make this very clear. You know, we talk about the Union and the Confederacy and all that. The Union is the United States government. The Confederate States of America are a group of people who tried to, to divide the United States government and create their own new nation based in slavery, in a, in a social system that was based on slavery, that they firmly believed was going to spread across the world and become a new era of human history. This was not some backward, you know, you know, look at poor us, we're just living the terror life. This was the best way for the society to be organized is for a few guys to run it, to have enslaved the people below them, to make a ton of money doing this, which will raise the standard of living for everybody, including, they say, civilizing, and that's in quotes, uh, the people who, uh, who, who do all the work. And they, they, this is the way to organize society rather than frittering away the, the money and the uh, resources of society on those workers. They really believe that that system is going to spread across the world and going to become the hallmark of the future. And um, I actually need to give you some citations for some of this because there's, there's some, uh, well, let me just give you the name. There's a book called One Vast Southern Empire. Um, uh, by a man whose last name is Park that is just a, a fabulous uh, read on, I'm sorry, Carp, uh, a fabulous read on this issue, a very fabulous read and a quick read if anybody's interested. All right, so, um, so they're really attacking the U.S. government. And why did the U.S. government simply say, okay, never mind. Okay, so of course, all we can do is make some guesses here because all we can do is look at the at the sources. First of all, the person in charge of this initial surrender was U.S. Grant, um, Ulysses S. Grant. And um, so he initially gives quite lenient terms of surrender to the men um, under General Robert E. Lee, uh, who surrenders his Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. And he does so out of respect for the, um, out of respect for the, the people he has fought so long uh, and, and out of magnanimity, really. But because he does that, that gets manipulated very quickly among Southern mythologists, if you will, including um, Robert E. Lee himself. Uh, there's a book by Elizabeth Varon who takes a look at what uh, Appomattox meant to Robert E. Lee and to Southerners. And uh, they quickly decided that the reason that Grant was so magnanimous in that was not because he was trying to be a nice guy, and I'll explain to you in a little bit why I think he did it, but because he recognized that they really should have won, that they had the better cause. And they hadn't won simply because they didn't have that sort of money-grubbing northern industrial backing that enabled their noble cause to be put down. They were, you know, the noble cause that was put down, if you will, by the, the, the rabble. And that is what's going to become ingrained in Southern mythology and is going to, uh, to mix with another theme to become um, the, the statues that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So, uh, so on the one hand, the Southerners are thinking that that's what's going on. What's Grant up to? Well, one of the things that Grant is up to is when this all transpires, it's spring. It's early April. And Grant and his people have been in the South, and they recognize that the that the the South is devastated. Um, you know, every bit of time everybody says America's never won a war. I'm like Southerners did, and and after the war, the place is devastated. I mean, the the fields have gone to weeds, and you know, a lot of people don't know this anymore, but. But you can't just turn animals out into any old field. You know, fields are poisonous, a lot of things. So, for example, you know, in New England, you can't put sheep in a field that's got milkweed in it because milkweed is poisonous to sheep. So, like, all the fields are ruined. Um, you, you, you're you going to have to go through and, and clean out all the fields again. And seeds, it's not like you can go to burpee seeds because there isn't anything like that. Seeds are handed down father to son in the South, and, and they're all gone. I mean, they're all ruined. And the um, the 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 economic system is completely destroyed. Like who's gonna work the fields? I mean, things are really bad and it's spring. And if you know about agricultural reasons, regions, you know spring is a really bad time 
for food because you don't really have any food yet until stuff starts growing. So, you know, those early months are not good anyway. And if you add the war on top of it, these people are starving to death. And Grant gives the terms he gives, at least in part, because he wants those soldiers to be able to go home and plant fields because they're going to die otherwise. America's going to lose a lot, of, a lot of people. So he's trying to be magnanimous enough to say, go ahead, keep your mules, keep your horses, the ones that are alive, and keep your guns so you can hunt and go home and, and, and be part of this new free labor society. Go home and work. And, and tr we'll try and heal the nation this way. It was, I think, a very magnanimous situation and one that possibly could have worked. But of course, what nobody could see was that Abraham Lincoln is going to be assassinated. And that, that is the moment that changes everything. Because with that, you get not a Republican to put into that seat, but rather a Democrat. A Democrat who hates African Americans, does not want to see equality, simply wants to see white supremacy reestablished over the South and does everything he possibly can to make that happen in the summer of 1865. He simply says to Southerners, hey, so long as you swear an oath of loyalty to the government, um, you know, you can be a, a citizen again, you can vote again. And if you can't, if you're, you know, if you swore an oath and broke it, or if you're worth more than $20,000, or if you're a high ranking official, you have to beg me personally, but I'll be pretty good about it. And he was, he did, he let all but about 1500, 1500 Confederates back into the union by the end of the summer and basically said to them, don't worry about black rights. Just don't make them slaves and we're good. And what they do, of course, is they put in place um, the black codes, which uh, are essentially, they're not a reinstatement of legal slavery, but they are a reinstatement of serfdom. And that um, they put in place in the summer of 65. Now those actually never become law because those governments are undermined by the Republican Congress when it comes back in session in December of 65. They say, no, no, no uh, expletive way are we gonna let this happen. But what essentially happens in the summer of 65 when Congress is not in session is that Johnson can do whatever he wants. And what he does is he puts back in place the almost the pre-war Confederacy. And really, truly, nobody saw that coming. Lincoln, uh, of course, did not expect he was going to be assassinated. And he um, had no reason to think that that, was, that that was on the table because no American president had ever been assassinated before. So, um, so that's probably what is going on with, um, with Grant. But why doesn't Congress do something? And Congress doesn't do anything for the simple reason, uh, do, do something in, in the early years, for the simple reason that they know people in the South. You know, these are their friends. And they there's actually this conversation that goes on that takes place in March of um, uh, late uh, February, early March of 1865, when they're talking about the Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, I'm sorry, uh, Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. And the reason that that's called Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands is because the refugees are the white people. And they literally, when they go to write a law that's going to help freedmen, uh, freed people, the congressmen literally say, I am not going to give federal money to African Americans when my own cousins are starving to death in Mississippi. So they write the law in such a way that the white people come first and then the freedmen and then the abandoned lands. And that becomes an issue. It, it, they drop the word the, the word refugees, although certainly white people are benefiting from that law in the summer of 65 when the white supremacists in the South want to get rid of the law that uh, permits the army to step in and help African Americans altogether. And that's when it starts being called the Freedmen's Bureau rather than the Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. Um, again, they make it, they try to make it look like it's all about black people. And when it's really not, it's about economics. All right, so um, so the Congress really uh, wants early on to help its um, to help the people in the South. Uh, the white people in the South, as well as, the, as well as the black people in the South, they're not ignoring them, but they want to help the white people because they're related to them, among other things. But they've got a real problem by December because with Johnson's blanket pardons, the white people have all been returned. And now this Congress is going to have to find some way to create a new kind of politics to, to include these people. So they're kind of, there's this weird, you know, Johnson basically, as it's this weird tension that happens because Johnson basically says, you know, never mind, we don't care about the war that just killed 600,000 people and cost $6 billion, you know, we're good. And, and it's just this crazy moment in American history. All right, so, so what happens? So they're back in 
And, and I want to jump ahead because I do want to get to one last question here. So, so what happens is the idea of being a Confederate does not, in fact, become a negative thing because there, there's very little punishment for it, to be honest. There's uh, Henry Wirtz is killed because he was is executed, I'm sorry, because he oversaw the Andersonville prison camp where so many Union soldiers were starved to death. But other than that, the only people to, um, to pay, if you will, with their lives for anything associated with the Civil War, aside from the soldiers, are the people who conspired to assassinate Lincoln which is astonishing after a war of that length and size. I mean, it's really astonishing. So you get these legends about how, you know, the South was so harsh. The South was not, I'm sorry, the North was so harsh. The North was not harsh. I mean, look what happened in China. You know, the, the North was like, yeah, we don't get along with you guys. And rather than saying, okay, yeah, and we've been chastised, the South says, well, you're only trying to get along with us because we were right all along. Well, how does that happen? That happens in part because um, the one of the ways that the that the southerners regain control of their society is based in taxes and what they argue is that the northern policies put in place by the republican party to help african americans in the south after the civil war are in fact a form of socialism and what they say is that the republicans by trying to you to create po federal policies to help african americans that must be paid for with tax dollars are essentially instituting socialism in america and they use the word socialism beginning in the 1870s. 1871 is when social, the word socialism really starts being used in this tax sense because, to go back to what I started with, in the Civil War we have for the first time income taxes as well as these federal manufacturing taxes. And by 1870, we have the 15th Amendment, which says that African Americans can vote. So we get this link between the idea of policies that help African Americans and the idea of white tax dollars going to help them, linked to this idea of socialism, the idea of the redistribution of wealth. So what happens is that when that takes off, the uh, the world, the, the, the American South especially, and Democrats in the North start to talk about how just ducky the West is. Because in their vision, and it's not true, but in their vision, the West is this place where the federal government is not doing that. It's not redistributing wealth to help people of color. Emphatically, it's not. There's another story going on in the West. But, um, but that's only happening back east. In the west, a man can be free, you know, he can do his own thing. And again, I've talked a lot about how that's actually a myth. But that whole idea of the American cowboys being the heart of America takes off after the Civil War. Now, what happens is that increasingly people in the west and in the south begin to to fight back against the idea of government help for African Americans as being a form of socialism, a waste of tax dollars. And as that takes off, um, Americans, in the, again, largely in the West and South, cling to this idea of the independent American, the guy who's doing it, who's fighting back against the, the behemoth government, against socialism, against uh, the idea of the federal government helping black people, and they start to cling to the idea of the cowboy, you've got Buffalo Bill rising by 1883, and the Confederate soldier. In 1890, between 1890 and 18, uh, 1920, you get the rise of all these statues of Confederate soldiers in the South primarily, but also in states in almost all the states of the Union. The idea that the Confederate soldier was not fighting for slavery, which is crap, of course he was fighting for slavery. Um, he was not fighting for slavery, he was fighting for independence. He was fighting for, for being the, you know, pushing back against socialism, against, against the, the behemoth government that was gonna use tax dollars to help what by this period is known, of, known as lazy people of color. So you get this idea, this rising idea of these, um, these um, statues as, as being images of the principle of the little white guy, you know, not physically little, but the, the individual, individualist white guy standing against a behemoth government that's going to use tax dollars to help black people. 
So the idea of these Confederate statues as being history is not really at all about the Civil War. What they are is they're the history of the period in the late 19th, early 20th century where white supremacy is, um, is really taking over the South and the West, and certainly nobody in the North is thinking it's all that bad an idea. And they're commemorating that in these statues. So here's a way to think about those statues. When people say, oh, you're erasing history. Well, you're certainly erasing the history of the 1890s to the 1920s. But people always say, oh, well, then, then you've got to take down um, Washington and, and everybody else because they're all, you know, they've all done bad things in their lives. The way to think about statues is this. Um, this what, are, what are the values that statues are commemorating? Because they're really not about history. They're about commemoration. And the reality is that there is not a single statue of any human being that is not going to be problematic in some way because humans are flawed. I always say about this, you know, if we're going to start taking down all the statues, we got to get rid of all of them because every single one of those guys that is up on a pedestal was a misogynist. And that's a real issue for me. Um, but if you think instead about what the values are that those statues are supposed to be commemorating, we don't have statues up of George Washington because he was a slaveholder. We have statues of him up because he refused to be a king. The fact he was a slaveholder is a huge problem and that needs to be contextualized, but we are commemorating his devotion to democracy, or in that case, a republic. When we look at the little Confederate soldier or the statue of the individual Confederate soldier, the values we are commemorating are white supremacy. Those are very different things. I would also add that I object to having anything to do with the Confederacy on federal property by the same token of the fact they they rebelled against the government. Why on earth do we have statues to people who tried to destroy our government? I don't know of any other government in the world that does that. Um, Again, just to go on a little bit more about this, um, the so how does so so we get these? There's this window of time when we get these um, these Confederate statues, and then there's really kind of a lull in the commemoration of the Confederacy. There's a period when people are not really lionizing the battle flag, which is what that flag is that flies, and there's a period in the 1930s and the 1940s, in fact, when the South quite likes the intervention of the federal government to get it out of the Depression and then to fight World War II. So. Um, so what happens? What happens is we get, again, the commemoration of the Confederacy after the second civil rights movement in the 1950s. So with the passage of Brown v. Board of Education or the decision of Brown v. Board of Education from the Supreme Court in 1954, we get, um, we get the rise again of the commemoration not only of the uh, the uh, the battle flag, the Confederate flag, but also of the cowboy. Those things are very closely entwined. The idea of the individual against the behemoth government that is going to help African Americans. And so, in the 1950s and the 1960s, you do in fact get the rise of uh, the Confederate flag over the state house again. You get the um, people starting to to rebuild Stone Mountain in Georgia, which had been begun in the late 19th century and then abandoned, and it was begun again in the 1960s. It's actually dedicated uh, the weekend after Kent State by Sparrow Agnew. Um, everyone thinks it's from that earlier period. It's actually from 1970. You get this, this adherence to Confederate iconography. You also get, in the same period, the rise of the Westerns, the TV Westerns, the individual guy who's fighting against um, in usually Indians or bad guys or whatever without the help of the government. And those two images really take over American society after the second civil rights movement. They take off in the 1970s when you get people wearing blue jeans, for example, in an embrace of that Western culture, the rise of little girls wearing prairie dresses and the popularity of uh, Little House on the Prairie on TV. Um, and then you get that picked up really dramatically, of course, by Ronald Reagan, who pretends to be uh, a Western cowboy. He's actually a very accomplished horseman, but he rides in the English fashion. He adopts the cowboy hat and the, and the, and the, um, the blue jeans and the cowboy boots for his political campaign. Um, and you get, again, the, the reinforcement of this Western image of uh, women as wives and mothers. And you get the rise as well of the pro-Confederate iconography, for example, um, 
um, Ronald Reagan giving his uh, acceptance or giving his announcement speech that he's running in Philadelphia, Mississippi, right where civil rights workers were had been murdered. I mean, this was really quite deliberate. So that second rise of Confederate iconography and Western iconography is really tied again to the rise and cementing of um, white supremacy in the South after the destruction of Reconstruction in the 1880s and the 1890s. Um, all right, so I've given you probably uh, more than you wanted to hear already. Um, I did want to talk uh, a little bit today about voter suppression. And I'm looking here, my clock says I have five minutes, which is not at all enough time to talk about voter suppression. But let me give it a shot. Jane Hessline said, have there been successful efforts in the past to block voter suppression that might be effective now? This is a, a tru truly great question. And the short answer is yes. The short answer is that when there is political will to expand suffrage, we get expanded suffrage. And when there is not, we get voter suppression. Because there are two ways to win an election. You can either expand the voting base, including more people, which is how we get uh, women's suffrage in places like Wyoming, or you can, um, or and even uh, women's suffrage in general in the uh, with the 19th Amendment, or you can suppress the vote. And suppressing the vote is often a lot easier than expanding the vote because rather than trying to get ballots to people, to educate people, to get them to the polls, you simply make sure your, your opponents can't get there. And that, um, that suppression of the vote has been the one that people have turned to most often since the Civil War with one dramatic exception, but it's not new to them. Actually, um, uh, Thomas Jefferson's party is the first one really to employ uh, voter suppression to make sure that Jeff Jefferson is gonna win an election, which is itself a fascinating story. But um, voter suppression is also responsible in 1860 in the South for, um, for the attempt to destroy uh, anybody who might vote against the Democratic candidates in the South. So you literally have people who are ridden out of rails in the, the election of 1860 in the South. There are people who are warned out of town in that election. That's not unheard of. Um, but what happens during the Civil War is we get this dramatic expansion of the concept of who gets to participate in American society. Women are not going to be included in this period, although they're certainly going to be agitating for it immediately after the war. But what does happen is that African-American men are included in that expansion of citizenship and of having a say in society. And we get, thanks to that, we get by 1870, our first African-American legislators elected to Congress. So in 1870, we get Hiram Rebels uh, appointed as the um, the the senators are in the 19th century appointed, I think in that case by the governor, um, to the Senate from Mississippi. And we all, by the time he leaves, he's got a very short term and he's replaced uh, by a full term senator. By the time he uh, rebels leaves, there's an African American in the South, uh, in, from South Carolina in the House of Representatives, a man named Joseph Rainey. So as early as 1870, we're going to get African American representation in the Congress. And the government puts its weight behind that when in fact, um, the Ku Klux Klan tries to stop African-American voting in the early 1970s, tries to stop African-Americans from being political actors. Uh, when that happens, we get uh, the Republican Congress creating the Department of Justice. That's where we get that. And they march on, the Department of Justice goes on down there and it arrests, arrests thousands of people and says, we're not gonna tolerate you keeping African-Americans from the polls, terrorizing African-Americans. This is not gonna happen. The federal government puts its weight behind that. But we lose that popular will in the early 1870s. And we lose it, I think, because of the construction of the idea that black voting is going to create socialism. It's going to create this redistribution of wealth from white people to black people. And that's a concept that Northerners start to think is probably not such a great idea because they're worried themselves about the influx of immigrants that are coming into Northern cities. 
and very worried that immigrants are going to be voting for, for uh, public improvement uh, projects that are going to have to be paid for with tax dollars. So Americans lose the will, white Americans lose the will to protect the expansion of suffrage. And it's not just people in the East that lose that will, it's also people in the West who don't like the idea of Chinese voting, for example, and certainly don't like the idea of Mexican American voting. And so they're not so willing to say, yes, everybody should be allowed to vote because they're not so sure about the racial lines that they want to preserve as well. So we lose that will, and you're going to see less and less black voting after 1886. Again, always with the argument that, at least in the early years, that the reason that white people don't want black people to vote is because they say they're socialists, that they're going to vote for policies that have to be paid for with tax levies. By the 1880s and the 1890s, though, they have stripped that veneer off and they are talking solely in racial terms. And those racial terms, and by the way, the tax argument was always a, a cover for the race. I mean, the two go hand in hand. But um, by the 1890s, they've stripped off the tax version for the most part. There's a couple of places where it still shows up, but plenty of people are simply talking about race. Nonetheless, although there are going to be fewer and fewer African Americans elected to Congress after 1886, which is the first time there's an all white Congress elected after, after the Civil War, African Americans are going to continue to vote in some kind of numbers simply because they often were the swing votes between um, different parties in state or local elections. So they are able to continue voting. And until 1901, there will be at least one African American sitting in Congress. After 1901, when that gentleman leaves, there will be no African Americans in the American Congress for nearly 30 years. This is defended in 1890 by a group of white congressmen in a book called why the solid south in which they say the solid south has to be democratic because if you let and, and white because if you let black people vote they're going to vote for to redistribute wealth um, that argument is a very thinly veiled argument to hide the fact that the South is no longer a democracy. It is a one-party state, and it's a one-party state that thrives on voter suppression. And this becomes really clear in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, when in fact there is a local government that's elected by a combination of black Republicans, that is African-American Republicans, a few white Republicans, and also some white populists. They are fairly elected. They take over the government, and there is a riot on the part of the white better people in Wilmington who uh, say that under no circumstances will they be ruled any longer by men of African origin, as they say, and that even if they have fairly won, it doesn't matter because they should never have been voting in the first place. And this is a full-fledged political coup in American history. It is also the end of democracy in the South until uh, you know, for decades. It's simply African Americans are not going to be allowed to vote. But you have to remember that is voter suppression. Um, now, that's going to change in World War II when there is, again, a major change of will because everybody has turned out to fight that war. And, and the government has worked really hard to emphasize that everybody is, is an American. Everybody is behind this war effort. Everybody's efforts matter. Now, again, mind you, these are not egalitarian days. African Americans are still going to be segregated. They're still going to be paid less. Um, you know, they're not going to be able to serve in certain places and all those sorts of things. But that being said, there is this pressure on the part of popular culture, the government and popular culture, to say all Americans are in this together, not least because the Nazis pushed very hard on the idea that black Americans were not equal, so why on earth should we say democracy is any better than a system like fascism? And FDR and uh, later Eisenhower and Truman push back very, very hard on this, and they want to make sure that they can say that everybody in America is equal. So with that pressure and with pressure from African American groups, and really importantly with pressure pressure from uh, Me Mexican-American groups, uh, really, uh, um, uh, of course, now, now I'm drawing, the, on the, uh, drawing a blank because I've been doing this for an hour, but the Mexican-American groups who argue for inclusion in American society, Hector Garcia, Dr. Hector Garcia, um, the American GI um, Legion, I'll talk, tell you about another time. Um, 
uh, they put pressure on the government to include everybody in American society. And from this, we're going to get the civil rights movements, American Indian movement, um, the, uh, the women's rights movement, the African American movement, of course, all that's an attempt to create an inclusive society. And from that, in 1965, we get the Voting Rights Act. And that is the symbol of what one can do if one has the will to create an inclusive society. Can we stop voter suppression? Yes, of course we can stop voter suppression, but we have to have the will to do it. And the will to do it does not simply mean saying, yeah, come on, everybody has a right to vote. It means putting pressure on secretaries of state, say state secretaries of state to have mail-in voting now, for example, to make sure voting machines are available and to make sure voting machines are secure, which they largely are not right now. Many of them do not leave a paper trail. And to change the mechanics of how we vote so that we can make sure that everybody, in fact, does have a say. And the reason that that matters, I want to emphasize once again, the reason that matters is there are two ways to look at society. And you don't have to agree with me. There's two ways to look at society. You can either believe, as the Confederates did, that the society works, or as, as, as many leaders around the world have over time, that society works better when a few wealthy, well-connected, well-educated, rich men run everything because they're the ones who really understand how things work. Or you believe that society works better when you kind of crowdsource it, when you say that you need to put resources at the bottom and trust that people will make good decisions. Not everybody. You don't have to win everybody, but you have to win a majority of people making good decisions to move society in a good direction. Which way do you think society works better? For myself, like I keep saying, I side with Lincoln. I think I want the regular people to make the decisions, not cutting out the people at the top, but I don't think they should have more say than people at the bottom. And if we have the universal will to make that happen, to pressure Congress to do that, to pressure our representatives, our local representatives to do that, can we do it? Absolutely. We've done it before. We can certainly do it again. Probably more than anybody wanted to know about taxes, Confederate statues and voter suppression, but there you go. Thanks for coming by. Hope it was fun. My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a historian. I do not speak for my employer. I'll see some of you on Thursday at four o'clock. No, I won't. Thursday at one o'clock. And, uh, and many of you may be back next week here uh, at one o'clock to do history and politics. Thanks very much.